So it's 1789 and the United States is on its second government. Basically every country around the world is looking at the U.S. and thinking this thing is going to be a failure. You've got monarchies everywhere saying how dare these guys try a different form of government or Republican form of government. Uh, we saw what happened with these Arts Confederation. I'm sure uh, it's only a matter of time before this government fails. And that's a realistic thought. A lot of people are thinking only sooner uh, or later we're going to see these states break apart. Pretty soon we're going to see the nation of Georgia, the nation of South Carolina, nation of New Hampshire, that kind of thing. People are thinking these guys aren't going to last together very long. And a lot of people are thinking maybe, hey, Britain will take back over here. You know, maybe these guys are going to start infighting with one another. Basically, people in 1789 are thinking the United States is going to fail. And as we talked about last time, it's going to be up to this new government to handle this situation. So we've already had this new constitution installed. We've had the first meeting of our new constitutional government. Now we're going to have this guy in charge. And as we talked about, the executive branch isn't the uh, executive branch in modern times, but it's still a really powerful body, and it's going to be representative of this United States. So we've got this new president. George Washington coming into office and as this guy that the American people trust it's going to be his job to make sure this US government doesn't fail he's got to be the one to help pay off the debt again now it's Congress that's going to be the one passing taxes if they want to go that way raising duties but Washington's got to be the leader to represent them he's also got to be the guy to deal with foreign countries. How's we're going to talk about what happens if Britain comes in and starts uh, punking you? What happens if France comes in and starts uh, demanding things of you? How are you going to deal with these problems? We saw the Articles of Confederation government didn't do a very good job. Um, and can you solve the problems of the United States? Can you pay off this debt? Can you deal with these foreign countries without violating the liberties promised in this new Bill of Rights? Can you, uh, again, solve these problems without taking away the right to free speech, uh, not establishing a religion, all these different divisive things that are happening in the United States. Can you get them done uh, under this new constitution? Well, Washington, as, again, this executive head of state, commander of the army, it's going to be his primary responsibility to sort of hold the U.S. together at this time. Well, as the uh, president Washington can't do all this stuff himself. So as laid out in the Constitution, and as approved at the first meeting of this constitutional government, Washington's going to have some people to aid him in his job as executive. So he needs somebody to help him collect taxes, enforce laws, make treaties, that type of thing. So he's going to put together a cabinet. Today, President's cabinet huge. There's like 12 different cabinet members, something like that. We have a uh, Secretary of Education, Secretary of Housing and Urban De Development, Secretary of the Interior. We have all these different uh, cabinet members. Washington, when he starts out, he's really only going to have four. He's going to have Secretary of War, a guy named Henry Knox. We're not worried about him. Uh, he's going to have an Attorney General. Don't worry about this guy. But the two main people to help him are going to be this guy Alexander Hamilton and this guy Thomas Jefferson okay Alexander Hamilton is going to serve as Washington's Secretary of the Treasury so what a Secretary of the Treasury is going to be is basically Washington's liaison to Congress so I need somebody to talk to Congress about ways to pay off this debt guys you need to raise revenue for this or you know I've got a military issue I need uh, to put together money for that tell Congress this is what I need so a money guy he needs a guy to go between Washington and Congress with money and his Secretary of State is going to be a guy named Thomas Jefferson so as Secretary of State Jefferson's job will be to negotiate between United States and foreign countries. So you have an issue with Spain, Jefferson sends somebody over to make a treaty with them, or Jefferson meet with them, make this treaty yourself, and you're going to be sort of my go-to guy uh, with foreign nations. So this is going to help him in his capacity as head of state, Jefferson will, and uh, Alexander Hamilton's going to help him with financial matters in Congress. These two positions are still around today, uh, and they still do pretty much the same thing as they're going to do uh, when Washington starts his first administration in 1789. All right, so he's got these guys to help him. What something's going to unique is going to happen immediately after 
Washington takes office. And this is going to be something that the Founding Fathers didn't plan on. What's going to happen is these two guys, and this is going to uh, be the first real meeting of these guys. Uh, it actually is the first two times these guys meet, or the first time these guys meet. Uh, Jefferson had never met Hamilton before. Hamilton never met Jefferson before uh, their first cabinet meeting. Well, they're going to meet one another, and it's very quickly going to become evident that these two guys have a different vision for the future of the United States. So we just had this Constitution written giving more power to the national government, but exactly the lengths of this power, it's open to interpretation. So, you know, we think, all right, the Constitution's there, it's written in stone. Well, you can interpret the Constitution just like almost any written document. You can interpret it in multiple different ways. You can look at it, same line, same sentence, and one person might say this sentence means this another person might say this sentence means something completely different well what we're gonna have is Jefferson's gonna view this Constitution and the powers of this United States government and he's gonna see the national government yeah sure we need it more powerful into the Arnold's Confederation than, than what we had in the Arnold's Confederation but I think maybe states should have uh, equal power to the national government, if not more. And Hamilton, when he comes in in 1789, he sees the Constitution and basically he looks at it and says, I think this says that the national government has a lot more power. And what we're going to see when both these guys start speaking with Washington in his cabinet meetings is both of them will push their version of the Constitution and their vision of the future of the United States. And they're going to disagree so much that very soon into Washington's administration, they're going to start forming what could essentially be political parties. Now, when the Constitution was written, the uh, delegates that met at the Constitutional Convention, they briefly discussed the idea of political parties. They thought um, they'd seen some examples of political parties in Britain, in their parliament, but they didn't think it's going to happen here in the United States. Basically, what they thought would happen is that the only time we're going to see people clicking up is geographically. So there might be, you know, different differences between uh, New Hampshire and Georgia, and you know maybe Georgia will get South Carolina to vote with it on some issues because they share commonalities. New Hampshire, Connecticut, they might vote together because they are close together. They share, you know, common economic concerns, things like that. And so they thought they might get geographic clicks. But what we're instead going to see is the thing that we see today, and that's political parties. What you're going to start getting, and this is going to be one group under the Federalists, and this is going to be under Alexander Hamilton, and another group called the Republicans. These guys are going to form under Thomas Jefferson. Is We're going to see these two parties start to form almost immediately. And what's going to happen is members of the party are going to do what members of the party do today. They're going to group together uh, for one basic common interest and vote together, but they're going to occasionally push aside their what's in their own best interest for the best interest of the party. So people that roughly agree with what Alexander Hamilton thinks about the future of the United States and his interpretation of the Constitution, they're going to click together and become Federalists. People that generally believe in Thomas Jefferson's vision for the future of the United States and his interpretation of the Constitution are going to click behind him and they're going to vote for these Republicans. Now this transition isn't going to be immediate. It's not going to click and start in 1789, but over the first years of Washington's administration we will see people start clicking up some people under Hamilton some people under Jefferson and it's not it's almost going to be a process that nobody realizes is happening until a year or two in so political parties are going to come to dominate US politics almost immediately and we're actually going to have this two-party system pop out right away and before we begin with this actually and talk about how these two political parties are going to form I want to caution you against trying to make comparisons with modern political parties. So as we're going to see, uh, Jefferson's Republicans, they're not the same as the Republicans that exist today. I mean, they have some uh, commonalities to Republicans. They also have commonalities to today's Democrats. Uh, and Hamilton's Federalists, they'll have some things they share with modern Republicans, some things they share with modern Democrats. 
but they're not the same. You don't make these comparisons. If you try to make the comparisons, you're going to get uh, you know a headache. It's going to be too confusing. So set these th those comparisons aside. Okay, these are very different parties that are about to form. So how and why are these parties going to form out of a constitution and a government that had not planned for these political parties? And how is the constitution going to be able to deal with this? Well it really is going to start with Washington's cabinet. So both these guys almost immediately after this first cabinet meeting with Washington in 1789 are going to sit and whisper into Washington's ear and sort of push their idea for how to interpret the Constitution and how uh, to direct the, the future of the United States. Uh, I got right here, I have, you know, Hamilton as the devil, Washington as, or I'm sorry, Jefferson as an angel. Don't think about it it that way because as we're going to see both these guys have a little bit of angel and a little bit of devil uh, so sorry Hamilton you ended up with the devil not because you're a devil but because uh, uh, but because that's basically the art that I use so Washington's going to get these two guys whispering into his ear almost immediately uh, when he starts uh, at his cabinet so Hamilton's going to be the first out of the gate uh, to start influencing Washington and influencing politics in general. So before we talk about how Hamilton's going to influence politics, we should talk a little bit about who Hamilton was and why he thinks that the United States should head in the direction it should head. So Hamilton, very brief background on him, he was not actually born in the English colonies. Uh, unlike all these other uh, founding fathers we're going to talk about who were born in one colony or the other, Alexander Hamilton was actually born in the British West Indies. So it was a Caribbean island owned by the British. The British had, I believe, taken it off of Spain at one point in the past. Uh, sugar growing island, a couple other main crops there. And Hamilton's going to be born onto this island as a poor bastard literally a bastard not calling him names he was literally born a bastard his father didn't recognize him as a son so he's illegitimate his mother uh, was poor he and his brother are going to be uh, raised by his mom in this uh, uh, this Caribbean uh, island um, and very young age his mother and not too much long after his brother are going to die uh, and this is going to leave this poor bastard child in the Caribbean to make his way on his own well, fortunately for Hamilton, he's incredibly smart. He's going to get a job at a very young age as what you would call a bookkeeper for a merchant uh, on the on this uh, Caribbean island. So more or less, he would basically, you know, when goods came into the island, this merchant would sell them. He would bring goods in to send off to other uh, other places. And Hamilton's going to be the guy that's going to basically put in, all right, we received these items. We got this item in. We're, we're sending these items out. And Hamilton, from a very early age, is going to prove to be incredibly adept with numbers. Like, he's going to start proving this guy's output. You know, hey, maybe if we ship this with this product or if we maybe we uh, bring this in and say this, we can save a little bit of money in the long run. And he's going to start educating himself in numbers. He's actually going to start coming to the attention of a lot of local residents of the island uh, for his intelligence. Um, uh, this is actually going to lead him to start publishing stories in the local newspaper. You can go and uh, uh, read some of the stories he publishes. And he becomes well known around the island for his intelligence. This poor kid who, uh, who's, who's gotten an education, educating himself, and started to make something of himself. But everybody on the island realizes that no matter how much he does on this island, there's only so far he can go. If he can go somewhere else to get educated, then you know who knows what he can become so a lot of people are going to come together on this island they're going to put some money together and they're going to send Hamilton off to college now Hamilton uh, considers maybe going to England you know this is a colony of England they got some good schools there but ultimately that that uh, is not going to be in the cards so he looks around and these new English colonies or I shouldn't say new these uh, English colonies in the mid 1700s and uh, uh, 1700s they, they've got some good higher education uh, facilities. So he's ultimately going to go to New York where he's going to start studying law at a New York, what you would call a university today, uh, Institute of Higher Education. Start studying law. And uh, while he's doing this, we're going to see the outbreak of the American Revolution. So Hamilton, he initially is going to, as we're going to talk about 
he's got some complex feelings here, but he looks at the situation and he realizes these colonies, it doesn't make sense for them to stick around with Britain. They, you know, they can take care of themselves. They should be independent. So he's going to end up joining the Continental Army and he's eventually going to make his way into the service of George Washington. Washington is going to find this kid. Uh, Hamilton's much younger than Washington at this point. I shouldn't say much younger, but he's younger than uh, Washington at this point. But Washington sees this young kid uh, who's incredibly good with numbers, and he's going to make Hamilton his personal secretary. And by secretary, he's, uh, I mean, he's, he's Washington's numbers man. So we need some supplies here. We need some men here. Hamilton, what do the numbers say? So Hamilton's keeping these numbers, and he's basically supporting uh, Washington behind the scenes. Now he'll get into a couple uh, fights. There's one thing at Yorktown where you know he leads a uh, bayonet charge, but for the most part, he, he's a behind the scenes guy, and that's all he really needs to be because just Washington needs a, a numbers guy. Well, after this war, uh, Hamilton and Washington are going to stay close, and his association with Washington is going to allow Hamilton to get some positions in this new uh, Articles of Confederation government. Um, so the Articles of Confederation is set up. He's from New York. He graduates. He's going to practice some private law. He gets married. He's going to start having kids. But he's going to determine, I'm going to get into politics. And he serves the Articles of Confederation uh, in the legislature for New York. And then at the Constitutional Convention, when that's called up in 1787, New York's going to basically say, all right, we want you, Hamilton, you're a smart dude, uh, go represent us. So Hamilton will uh, represent New York at the Articles of Confederation, I'm sorry, the Constitutional Convention in 1787. So Hamilton's there, and he's seeing all these ideas thrown around about this is how we should uh, write this new government. Hamilton's actually going to be pushing for an extremely strong central government. He thinks the Arts Confederation is a disaster. He basically says, uh, this national government's too weak. We need to give it a lot more power. And he's going to be advocating for... Uh, almost entirely central authority. He talks about a president who serves for life. Now a lot of his ideas are going to be bat uh, batted down. As a matter of fact, the majority of them at the Constitutional Convention are batted down. Um, but, you know, the way he's going to look at it is wa after walking out is we need a stronger national government. Uh, at least we got one. I mean, that's better than nothing. And as we're going to see, he's going to basically say, and these are ways to manipulate this Constitution to make this national government stronger than a lot of these guys intended. So Hamilton uh, will leave the uh, our, uh, Constitutional Convention. He's uh, going to be writing one of the, the Federalist Papers, pushing for uh, this new Constitution. And then, as soon as we have the meeting of uh, this new Constitutional Government, 1789, and Washington's elected president, he's going to call up Hamilton and say, Hey, you're my numbers guy. I need a numbers guy. Come here and meet with me. New, new, uh, the capital of the United States so at this time is New York. So, uh, you know, meet me up in New York. And this is when Hamilton's going to come serve as Secretary of the Treasury. Well, Secretary of the Treasury, no power, really. There's, the, there's no power. He's basically a liaison between Washington and Congress. So Hamilton, in this position, doesn't have a lot of authority. But as we're going to see, through his connection to Washington, Hamilton is going to get a lot of things done through this fairly powerless position. And he's going to start whispering his beliefs into Washington's ears and use them to strengthen the Constitution in ways that a lot of people didn't think were, were possible. So again, you might want to think of this as uh, Hamilton whispering into Washington's ears. And when Hamilton whispers into Washington's ears, he's going to be pushing his beliefs about government and his beliefs about human nature and people in general. All right, so what are these beliefs? So Hamilton has, a, uh, has these beliefs about the nature of human beings. So to Hamilton, and this is kind of weird considering his upbringing as a poor kid, as a bastard, but Hamilton basically believes that human, uh, humans by nature are evil. So humans are out to fill their own basis needs, you know, feed themselves, procreate, eat, sleep, um, that's it. They're not they're in general not capable of complex thought, okay? The vast majority of humans, and this would be probably about 95% or so, Hamilton would classify as the mob. Basically, he thinks the mob 
are irrational people and again they're they're not thinking of anything else but meeting their basic needs they're not thinking about tomorrow they're not putting a lot of complex thoughts into things and he basically thinks that this mob needs to be controlled so think about him as looking out onto a crowd and seeing 95 percent of the people and saying these these people you know they almost need to be ruled over herded and um uh incapable of uh doing much more than fulfilling their base needs okay so the vast majority of people to Hamilton are the mob, uh, and again, these, this mob that can get out of control if you don't keep them in, uh, under control. And you, he would look at Shay's rebellion, and he'd basically say, "This is what happens when the mob gets out of control. We need a strong national government to keep people like that in check." So he thinks most people are the mob. Well, he thinks that there's some people, and again, I don't know if he even exactly lays out numbers, but probably about five percent or so Hamilton would regard as the elite. So to Hamilton, the elite are the wealthy, the rich, and the well-born, okay? So this would include um, those born into prominent families, you know, over in Europe, it'd be people like the uh, uh, aristocracy, you know, the royalty, stuff like that, just people that are born to other quality people, those would be part of his elite. Also, men like him. Hamilton had basically come from nothing and made himself wealthy, got himself educated, became a lawyer, got involved in New York politics and now national politics, and he had made something of himself. He'd gotten wealthy from nothing. So these people, the well-born and the self-made men to Hamilton are the elite. The elite to Hamilton are people who should basically be in control. Hamilton saw these elites as people the government should support and people who, whose aid you need in supporting the government, right? These people are capable of rational thought. They're capable of thinking beyond uh, the, their immediate needs. All right, so this is one of Hamilton's beliefs is um, this general belief about humanity. Another belief that Hamilton had was that and this ties directly to his beliefs about humans, uh, he believed that the United States government, and just about any government really, need to have a strong centralized authority. And we talked about this when he uh, was representative for New York at the Constitutional Convention. But Hamilton believes that you need a strong central government to better control the mob, okay? Um, basically, if you don't have a strong central government, then it's going to be more difficult to keep the people in check. So at the uh, Constitutional Convention, we already talked about the him proposing the idea for president for life. Uh, there's even talk, and I, I don't believe this has uh, been confirmed, but uh, there was suspicion that during the Artist Confederation period, he actually suggests to Washington, hey, the people love you. Why don't you gather together an army and march on the Artist Confederation government and take it over? the people wouldn't object to it you could then install yourselves as a king if you guys have ever played uh, Assassin's Creed 3 there's a DLC I haven't gotten a chance to play it where Washington ha follows Hamilton's advice takes over the Articles of Federation and installs himself as a monarch this is a uh, picture from that campaign so he thinks you need strong central leadership um, uh, in, in order to, to control the people um, so in, in as a uh, part of this strong national government he thinks you need a powerful national army he thinks the national government should have an army to keep down rebellions things like Shays rebellion to keep the people in check okay so strong national government and actually if Hamilton had his way he would rather there be no state government so as we're going to talk about when we get to Jefferson and the Republicans they have this idea of national government should have some power, but states should have more power. To Hamilton, national government should have all the power. The stronger the cent and more centralized the authority, the better. So strong centralized government, powerful large national army, little to no power in the states. Okay. Well, in order for this national government to function and this more centralized government to be efficient, Hamilton thinks that the government should form ties to the elite. So what this means is he basically says we have this class of people that has wealth, that has influence. In order for us to be able to do what we need to do, control the people, get things done, we need to make sure these elite are happy. So we need to do things to promote their financial well-being, 
um, and we need to do things that you know uh, will support them because if they can then support us with their money and they can support us with their influence and you know maybe if we help them economically this will create jobs and then we can create these jobs and we can uh, keep the mob in work because if the mob doesn't have enough money enough work they're gonna rebel and they're gonna do things like uh, Daniel Shays did so help the elite because they'll help the government uh, they'll loan money to the national government whenever it needs it. They'll use their influence to promote support for this national government. And the national government can repay this by uh, providing these guys with economic opportunities, things like that. So he's going to call for closer ties between the elite and the national government. All right. All right. So this is one of Hamilton's beliefs. Another one of Hamilton's beliefs he's going to push as Secretary of the Treasury is industry. So to Hamilton, he's going to look around the world. There are two leading powers in the world at this time. By this point, Spain has fallen off. It's gone on this downhill slide. The United States isn't at the point it's going to be later on. It's still weak. Again, people aren't even sure if it's going to survive. But the two most powerful countries in the world by far are England and France, or Britain and France. A um, lot of different reasons for these. this. You know, France talk about this later but you know large population large army uh, you, you can talk about that why it's powerful but the reason that Britain is powerful at least to Hamilton is the fact that Britain has gotten out ahead in manufacturing so what Britain's doing and has been doing for 100 years at this point is it's been taking raw goods and turning them into finished goods. So Britain will take wool from one of its colonies and then a British manufacturer will turn that wool into finished cloth or finished shirts. It'll take tobacco from its colonies, turn it into a finished cigar, take leather, turn it into a finished shoe. And then it will take this finished goods and it will sell it, say maybe even back to the place that it got the leather from at 10 times the cost. So basically, they're taking this cheap good and then through a little manufacturing, turn it into a much more expensive good. And then they sell this good back to the uh, whoever for 10 times uh, what they bought it for. So this brings a ton of wealth into Britain. And then Britain can use this wealth to build a navy, to increase the size of its army. So the way Hamilton sees things is that if you become industrial like Britain, you can emulate its success and your uh, nation can become powerful for like the British. So for Hamilton, he would like a strong central government and he would like this government to promote industry. And as a matter of fact, to Hamilton, a perfect vision of the United States would be factories up and down the coast uh, and the U.S. would be taking in raw goods not at this point US is mainly a producer of raw goods but we get rid of doing that and we basically emulate what Britain does and uh, produce manufactured goods this should be the future of the United States so this is another one of Hamilton's beliefs so a final uh, one of Hamilton's beliefs is he feels that the United States needs to develop and foster commercial ties with Britain and political ties as well Hamilton loves Britain. He loves the idea of uh, the monarchy. He loves the way that the British had assembled their government. He loves how it's a powerful centralized authority around Parliament and the King. And Hamilton, basically you could call him what an Anglophile. Like he, he uh, uh, believes that uh, the way that they do things is just about right. And if we're going to be a successful nation, we need to just basically do everything that they're doing. Not only that, we need to maintain the ties that we'd had with them before. Now this kind of sounds a little unusual because he basically, in perfect word, wants to take over Britain and manufacturing. Why would you promote ties and close relations to Britain if you're trying to basically outdo them? Well again, one, it's because he likes them, uh, but two, it's because the way he sees things is if we continue our ties with Britain, we can use these ties to start implementing changes within the United States to, to emulate Britain. So let me, let me just put it this way. Britain, up to this point, is still the United States, by far the United States' uh, primary trading partner. It had been pretty much the exclusive trading partner prior to the uh, War of Independence. Uh, after the war, Britain put these high duties on incoming American goods. But, uh, for the most part, uh, even in spite of these goods, 
the U.S. is still trading a lot more to Britain than it is to France, Spain. It's really even trading more to Britain than uh, all the rest of the countries in the world combined. And the way Hamilton, and it's, the trade is primarily in raw goods going to Britain uh, for British manufacturing, but the way Hamilton sees things is we've already got commercial ties there. We know they're going to be purchasing our goods. So what if we keep selling them these goods uh, and then we maybe use some of the money from the sales, maybe import-export duties, and then we use it to promote our own manufacturing. So let me put it this way. Hamilton likes the British and wants to emulate the British, and he wants to promote commercial ties to him because he sees in the future this would um, uh, help the United States. So uh, continue our ties with them. We already have their, their business, uh, uh, so we continue this business. It's just that we uh, uh, use the products of this business to further our other ends. So how are you going to do this, Alexander Hamilton? How are you going to push this vision of the United States as Secretary of the Treasury? Again, a position that has no real political power. Well, what Hamilton is going to do, and this is going to be right out of the uh, gate. So, 1789, we have our first meeting of Congress. Right as soon as the Congress is meeting, Hamilton's going to be drawing up a series of proposals for Congress and something he's going to call the Report on Public Credit. So, Congress is meeting. Hamilton's going to be writing up this Report on Public Credit. Okay. Um, so, what the Report on Public Credit is, is basically... It's it's not a bill. It's not a tax. It's not something that itself has any law behind it because it's all it is is just Hamilton writing his ideas about how the United States should deal with its economy. So it in of itself is nothing because the Secretary of Treasury doesn't have any power. What it is basically is his proposals for Congress to adopt. So Congress, we're currently in debt. The United States is in debt this time about 54 million. The states are in a lot of debt. Uh, this is my proposal to get us out of debt and to sort of uh, strengthen the economy of the United States. So what is this report on public credit? What is he going to re recommend to Congress? What Hamilton will recommend to Congress is that basically the national government should assume the debts owed by the states, okay? So at this point, you have all these colonies, the vast majority of them, well, I shouldn't say vast majority, but the majority of them are significantly in debt. So states like Massachusetts, there have been a lot of fighting there. They had to buy guns for their militia, pay their militiamen. They had plenty of damage to public buildings, things like that. Been a lot of fighting, and they had to borrow a lot of money from wealthy individuals to pay off this debt okay so we need to rebuild this public facility uh, hey Steve can I borrow some money I'll pay you back with interest well after uh, the revolution's over Massachusetts just like the rest of the colonies is an economic crisis can't repay this debt so uh, uh, you know whoever bill or whoever they let the borrow money from uh, he's still looking there uh, to get his money back so states owe debt uh, and again the national government done the same thing so you, Washington's got his uh, his army, tells his soldiers, you need to sign this contract, we're going to pay you, um, but, you know, they don't have the money at the time of the revolution, so they're going to be writing out a lot of IOUs, um, IOU 20 pieces of silver promised to pay you back, as we talked about before, uh, U.S. government couldn't pay this stuff back, so a lot of these guys have not seen their cash, they're needing this money, not only them, but also a lot of wealthy elites, and this is actually primarily who the debt's going to be owed to, had let this uh, U.S. government borrow some money, um, this new U.S. government, basically, I need some money for guns, I need to buy some cannons, hey Steve, you got a little bit of extra cash, you're wealthy, uh, can I borrow 20 pieces of silver, I'll pay you back 25 pieces of silver uh, in a couple of years. Well, Steve's still sitting there. Uh, owning, uh, you know, this IOU, but he hasn't got a return on it. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the IOUs owed to soldiers by 1789, a lot of those had basically been bought up by the wealthy. So you had a lot of these soldiers. I, you know, the U.S. government owes me 20 pieces of silver. Um, they can't pay me back. Well, this wealthy person says, all right, you know, I know, know you think, uh, you know, you're not going to get this back. I'll tell you what, I'll give you $2 or two pieces of silver for it. 
Um, and you're sitting here a soldier. You're looking at this 20 pieces of silver. You don't know if this U.S. government's going to survive. You need to feed your family. You give this guy this IOU. Uh, you only get two pieces of silver for it. But as you're thinking, I need the silver, and, and I'm probably not going to see the rest of the money anyway. So you sell it to this wealthy individual. So basically, state debt and national debt is owed to a wide variety of people, but it's primarily owned to the elite. So what Hamilton's going to say in the report on public credit is that the national government needs to pay off its debt, obviously, so we inherited this debt, we're, we need to pay it off, uh, but what it should not only pay off its debt, it should assume the debt of the states. So U.S. government's $54 million in debt, state governments, would that be $25, 26000000 million in debt, um, this is going to bring U.S. debt up to $80 million. So Hamilton's going to say, I propose the U.S. Ass assume this state debt. Now, if you're the state, you're going to be saying, well, hell yeah, this is awesome. I, I don't have to pay my bills. The U.S. government's going to pay my bills for me. Of course I want to do this. And you're going to get a lot of states immediately lining up for this. Imagine somebody coming around to your house and saying, um, you know, I'm going to pay your electricity bill. Of course, you know, I'm not uh, going to turn that down. So a lot of states are going to say immediately, heck yeah. But there's some states are going to be a little bit hesitant because they've already paid back their debt. States like Virginia and Maryland, uh, they didn't accrue that much debt during the American Revolution anyway, so uh, uh, they'd quickly paid it back a after the revolution was over. A lot of these states are going to be saying, you know, wait a minute, I don't, wouldn't this mean that the U.S. government, however it's going to collect this money, when it pays back the state's debts, wouldn't that be me, Virginia, basically paying off the debt for Connecticut or Massachusetts. I don't know if I like that. So some of the states are going to be nervous about it. Some are going to support it. But some people are going to basically be wondering, you know, well, what's the reason for this? Why are you paying Massachusetts electricity bill, essentially? Well, the reason Hamilton wants to do this is because he sees this as a way to tie the uh, elite to the national government. So if you think about the way things are in 1789, nobody knows if the national government is going to survive. Again, people are thinking there's almost as good a chance of the states breaking apart into 13 separate nations. And, you know, he thinks that, um, you know, some of the elites may even support this happening. Why would I, why would we have this national government? Why would we pay off this debt when we can just break apart, repudiate the national debt, and then, you know, we'll just pay off our local debt and we'll be done with it. I think we should rule things locally anyway. Well, Hamilton doesn't like the idea of states being independent of one another because he thinks in order for the U.S. to be strong, it's got to stick together, have a strong national government. So if he assumes the state's debts, basically this gets the elite interested in this national government survival more than they're interested in the state government survival. So if Bill it owes money to both, or the state of Massachusetts and the United States owe money to Bill, Bill kind of wants to see both the state of Massachusetts and the United States government survive equally. But if Bill is only owed money by the United States, the United States has to pay Bill a hundred bucks instead of, you know, the state of Massachusetts owing him fifty bucks, the United States owing him fifty bucks, then basically Bill is only worried about the United States' survival. He's worried about that more than the state of Massachusetts because Massachusetts owns, uh, doesn't own money anymore. The United States government owes them money uh, now. So basically, he wants this to, to tie the elites into the interest in the survival in the national government because he doesn't want the national government to die. Maybe think about this like you would think about the trolley problem. I don't know if anybody's seen uh, The Good Place. But they always uh, re reference this long-time uh, philosophical problem. You're basically got a uh, train going, uh, and then there's uh, on one tr path there's a person tied to the tracks. Another path there's uh, another person tied to the tracks. I'm doing a variation of it. But you know, if you're sitting there at the head of this train and you're sitting there, I can go left and kill this person, or I can go right and kill this person. If you have no interest in either person, I guess it doesn't really matter who you hit. You just got to make some sort of decision to turn right or left. But if you have a vested interest in one of those people, one of those people owes you a hundred dollars, and another person owes you nothing, you're probably going to hit the person that owes you uh, nothing because you want to get your hundred dollars back. So that's kind of what Hamilton's doing here: is if the U.S. government owes 
these wealthy money. The wealthy aren't going to speak out against the national government and are going to support it because they want to get their money back. It ties them to the national government. The other reason he proposes assuming this credit is because Hamilton wants to get uh, uh, wants the uh, uh, national government to pay this back. And he thinks, and we're going to talk about this in a second, he can come up with ways to pay back this debt. And if he does, he thinks this is going to build credit. So if you have a credit card, you charge up, you know, uh, pay your bill regularly every month, which Hamilton thinks he's going to do, be able to do. Maybe you start with a debt limit of $1,000, but very soon the credit card company says, I can trust this guy. If he needs money, I'm, I'm going to build his debt limit up to or credit limit up to $10,000. And I'm going to let him borrow money uh, whenever he wants, basically, because I know he pays him back. Well, Hamilton, he basically looks at it and says, all right, so we need uh, U.S. government whenever it needs money. At this point, you know, people are going to be hesitant to loan him back. But as soon as we pay back this debt... And let's say the U.S. gets into war, needs to build a navy really quick, needs to put together an army. They can go to Bill and say, hey, Bill, I paid you back timely manner with interest. Can I borrow money? Well, Bill, well, sure. You paid me back last time. I'm going to let you uh, borrow money again. So he thinks that by assuming this debt and then paying it off, you can build credit. So you can establish credit for the United States. So again, tying the elite to the national government more than the state government, not only that, but you uh, you build credit if you can pay it back. Well, again, some states are going to be hesitant about this because, you know, hey, we paid off our debt. I assume you're going to be collecting this in some form of tax whenever you tax, or you're going to use the money collected in duties uh, to take this out. Well, what, that would essentially mean that me, Virginia, having paid off my debt, uh, and one, one of the people that's going to be very objecting to this is going to be this guy, James Madison, who we're going to talk about a lot. He's a uh, House Representative member for Virginia at the time. He's basically going to say to Hamilton, uh, you know, we paid off our debt. So this is basically Virginia is going to be, by assuming this debt, Virginia is going to be paying the debt of states that didn't pay off their debt. We were responsible why should we pay for Connecticut, who wasn't responsible and paid off their debt? Uh, Madison's got a bunch of other object objections, like you know he doesn't like the fact that a lot of the debt's going to, uh, you know, going to be repaid to people who bought it for two dollars, uh, for two cents on the dollar, you know, from some uh, lower class guy who had to sell it to make ends meet. He doesn't like that. He would like the original purchaser to get some money. He's got objections left and right, but his main one is. This is going to hurt primarily southern states, but particularly Maryland and Virginia, who have already paid off their debt. So we don't like this. Well, in order to get, make guys like Madison happy, Hamilton is going to make a proposal. So 1790, after everybody reads this report on public credit, Congress meets again. They have this huge debate. Um, well, you know, I don't think I'm going to do it because, uh, again, we paid off our debt. And he's not able to get through the House of Representatives, in particular because of Maryland, Virginia's concern. Remember, House of Representatives, based on population, Virginia has a lot of members of the House of Representatives. Well, to make these members happy, Hamilton is going to propose, all right, right now the government of this uh, national government is uh, currently in, in New York City. What if we move it? to uh, Washington, D.C., we'll call it. We all like Washington. He's our president right now. What if we move it in between Maryland and Virginia? This would make it, you know, more southern located, make it close in between you two states uh, who are the main objectors to this. So it would make you happy. You guys wouldn't have to travel as far. Uh, so make it closer to, to the south uh, in general. Well, this is going to win over enough people to where we're going to see many of the House of Representative members from Virginia and Maryland are going to agree to this debt assumption lined out in the report on public credit. And so uh, we'll see. It's going to take 10 years for the Washington, D.C. and the new Capitol to be built, uh, but that's going to happen uh, uh, as, a, as, a, um, uh, as an agreement for this report on public credit. Temporarily, by the way, the Capitol will move from New York to Philadelphia, uh, don't worry about that too much, but you'll you'll see the capital move here until Washington, D.C. can be built. All right, so yay, Hamilton, you've accomplished, uh, again, moves uh, briefly to Philadelphia. Yay, Hamilton, you've 
accomplish assuming states debt so now the national government has gone from being 54 million in debt to something like 80 million in debt now you just got to pay it off okay so now the elites are vested interest in the US government and now as soon as you can pay this back you get credit but now you have to pay it back so how are you gonna do this well Hamilton is gonna come up with an idea called the a uh, whiskey tax alright so basically the US government can now tax something they couldn't do under the Arts of Confederation. It can collect duties on incoming goods, it can sell land in the West, and it is collecting duties. We talked about that before, and we talked about some selling land in the West. But the US is now 80 million in debt. You need another revenue source, and you need to tax something. Where can I get this tax money from? Well, Hamilton basically looks back to what happened uh, before the American Revolution. Uh, and looks back at Britain's attempt to tax uh, the colonies. They came up with that stamp tax. Again, the colonies uh, and now states, they have their own taxes, this, but this is done at the local level. If he taxes, this is going to be the first time at the national level you're going to see a tax. Britain had tried to do this by stamping, uh, requiring a stamp on paper, and then you had to pay for paper, but this had upset a lot of people, and in particular, the Stamp Act had upset Gov uh, government officials, it had upset lawyers, it had upset newspaper, media people, it had upset merchants, it upset the elite, the very people that um, you know have influence and a lot of the same people are going to start pushing for independence against Britain. So Hamilton needs money but he knows he can't look to the elite for money because he's trying to appeal to these elites. So um, I don't want to put a, a tax that will directly affect them but these are the guys that have the most money so we need a tax to pay off the debt but we don't want to take it from the people that I'm interested in helping out so how can we get money well Hamilton will start looking around everywhere who has money that might not have influence Well, what he's gonna settle on is this alcohol industry so Alcohol is produced everywhere, but a big area that's producing it is the frontier. So here, far away from the coast, you know, a handful of people west of the Appalachians, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but today when you think of whiskey, you generally think Tennessee, Kentucky. There's a reason for this, and again, you say western Pennsylvania as well, uh, and then east of the Appalachians over here as well. But there's a reason we think about this area as alcohol producing, and that's because being so far from the coast means that if you produced a perishable good and by the time you brought it to the coast it's going to be spoiled so this is going to include even things like grain so let's say you're a uh, you're one of the few people that moved out west into this area you you grow the best wheat you can possibly imagine or rye I don't even know what to exactly is in whiskey um, but you grow the great ingredients uh, but then if you try to ship these ingredients you know raw back over here by the time you get across the mountains your wheat would probably have mold in it you know maybe you've lost eight horses the transportation costs are ridiculous and by the time you get it to market where all the big cities over here are at or you know get it to a ship to bring over to Europe you know transportation costs are so ridiculous or you know the, the stuff your product just completely ruined so if you're producing whatever again it, by the time you get the coats it's not going to be any good on the other hand if you take that wheat and then you distill it into whiskey or some other alcohol first of all you're going to reduce I'm just making this number up but 2,000 pounds of grain you can maybe distill that down into a 50 pound barrel of whiskey so you're automatically reducing your transportation costs a little bit so you produce this and uh, reduce a 50 pound gallon of whiskey that's a heck of a lot uh, easier to transport this direction plus it's also not going to get moldy it's not going to spoil because it's liquor you know that liquor kills uh, bacteria microbes whatever the heck of uh, uh, fungus that causes all these different problems so you distill your stuff out here and then you bring this to market for much cheaper than you could bring raw wheat or rye or whatever uh, and people are still going to buy it for a lot of money because you know they have a need for liquor just uh, just like a uh, need for raw wheat and so you make a lot of money and you can come back here and do it again so along the frontier you have a lot of people producing alcohol 
for transportation reasons. But the thing is with these people on the frontier, they're not living in population centers. They're making money off the sale of this alcohol, but they're living far from where the newspapers are. The newspapers in Philadelphia, newspapers are not all the way out here. Newspapers in New York, they're not all the way out here. Uh, Newspapers in Charleston, not all the way out here. So if you upset these people by taxing them and taking a percentage of what they produce, then you know you're going to upset them. You're you're still going to make your money, but they're not going to be able to yell as loud as the elites would out here. So what Hamilton will do is he's going to propose a uh, eight cent a gallon tax on whiskey. This will basically be collected by sending these whiskey tax collectors out to these distilleries every year or so. They count up how much whiskey's produced and they take uh, eight cents a gallon. Uh, on the whiskey, 25% or so uh, off a gallon of whiskey will be uh, go to the U.S. government. And then the U.S. government can use this money to pay off debt or soldiers, whatever the government needs to use this money for. Well, he implements this, proposes to Congress. There's another long debate about it. But in 1791, the whiskey tax will be passed. And we're going to see these government tax collectors will start going out to these regions, upsetting the people out here. But the people out here will not be able to do anything about it because, again, um, uh, you know, they don't they aren't as loud as people in this direction. So now you're getting some of this money coming back in in the form of the whiskey tax. All right. So this is one of Hamilton's ideas in 1791 that will be passed. So we start out collecting this whiskey tax. Again, you couldn't tax under the Elders Confederation. They didn't tax until 1791 when this gets through. What else do you have Hamilton? Because this alone is not going to pay off this debt. Well, Hamilton is going to propose that instead of immediately um, paying back the debt and instead of immediately, you know, taking this whiskey tax and using it to pay back bill or, you know, using it for soldiers or whatever, instead you take that money and you stick it in a national bank, okay? He proposes in 1791 creating a Bank of the United States and he wants this to be chartered for 20 years. So what he's going to say is that um, for 20 years, the U.S. government is going to take a portion of the money they collect in the land sales, taxes, and uh, collect off duties and stick it in this bank. And what will then happen to this money is people can take out loans from the national bank. So he proposes establishing a bank for the United States. So the reason that he proposes doing this is because one he wants to collect interest payments so if you go up to the national bank US has all these bars of gold or silver in there and you say I need a you know I have a project I want to work on I need an upfront loan for it give me 20 pieces of silver this bank can say all right here's 20 pieces of silver I'm looking over your plan looks like it's financially foolproof Here's 20 pieces of silver. I want 25 pieces of silver in three years. Well, you, this guy gets his money back. There's now five additional pieces of silver that the U.S. government can use to pay off its debt. So you made additional money off interest from loaning it to this guy. So interest payments will increase the uh, uh, money coming into the U.S., which will help us pay off his debt and all its basic needs. Not only that, but it's going to help the economy of the U.S. And again, thinking about what Hamilton's trying to achieve here, it's going to help the elite. So a lot of the people that are going to be asking for, to borrow money from this national bank are those like, you know, wealthy individuals that might not have the upfront capital they need to get something done. And a lot of these guys got projects they want to get through. They can go to this national bank, again, owned by this new U.S. government, this new powerful, US, more powerful U.S. government, and they can go up here. I want to build a road between these two towns and charge a toll on it. So you go there, national bank looks at it, gives you out this loan. You then start cho- charging tolls. You're making money. You pay back with interest. And now you like this national government because, again, you uh, uh, it helped you out, helped you to make money. So you're going to support it more. Elites are going to make money off the national government uh, through these loans. And so they are going to support the national government more. Not only will it do that, but Hamilton thinks this is going to help promote industry and increase commerce between the various places. So if you, uh, let's say this guy wants to build a road between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, if he builds this road, we're now going to have more trade going between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia because instead of having to cross a bunch of muddy roads uh, to get from one location to another, 
this nice smooth turnpike uh, a lot of pe more people are going to trade and not not be afraid to go uh, bring their goods from one location to another so now you have more commerce which the Hamilton is good and he thinks that a lot of the loans given out by this national bank are going to be used to build factories so if you've got a guy wanting to build a uh, you know boot factory or something in Boston doesn't have the capital for it goes to the national bank and says hey can I build this uh, they give them the money, not only getting money back with interest, but at the end of the thing, there's going to be a boot factory where you're taking raw goods and turning it into finished goods, which again is something that Hamilton wants. So the National Bank will help pay back the debt, will uh, s support the elite, and uh, again, it's going to increase commerce and increase industry within the United States. Hamilton wants this. 1791, he makes a recommendation to Congress. Congress will pass a bill. Uh, pushing this national bank. So now we have uh, this this national bank being instructed. Um, actually, I should point out, it's not going to immediately pass. A lot of people are going to be objecting to this idea, particularly a lot of Southerners and Westerners. A lot of Southerners and Westerners, um, a lot of Westerners don't like Hamilton at this point because of uh, the whiskey tax, but a lot of Southerners don't like it because the Southerners in general don't trust banks. Basically, uh, the way things are done, if you're wealthy in the South and you have additional capital, use that additional capital by land and slaves. Uh, slavery is so pro profitable, especially in the Deep South uh, at this point, that if you have additional money, you buy slaves, you put them to work on land, you're probably going to turn a profit. I don't need to invest in a bank to get interest back because I can get interest by uh, starting a new plantation. So they just don't trust banks. The only time they ever really see banks is when banks foreclose on their land. You're also going to get some people when this bill goes through both houses, and again there's some opposition in both houses, but there are going to be some people that don't think it's constitutional. And this is actually going to face George Washington when he uh, he's prepared to sign it into law. So Washington, let's get a picture of Washington here. Uh, Washington, after it goes to both houses of Congress, again, the president signs off on bills. It's going to arrive on his desk. And I want you to imagine, you know, this new National Bank bill getting to Washington's desk. He's sitting there writing this stuff down. He's got his pen with ink, and he's about to sign off on this thing, put this thing into law. Well, imagine him sitting at his desk, and this isn't exactly how it happens, but it's easy to remember it this way. Right as he's about to sign it, he's going to get a knock on his door. Knock, knock, knock. Well, Washington will say, who is it? And Thomas Jefferson's going to walk in, and Jefferson's going to come up to Washington and say, hey, Washington... I don't know if you should sign this new national bank into law. Washington's going to say, "TJ, why not? You know, uh, you know, I think this is a, uh, I think this might help us pay back our debt. You know, I think this, uh, it makes sense." Well, Jefferson's going to say, "I don't think the thing is constitutional." Jefferson's going to adopt what we like to call a strict constructionist view of the Constitution. Basically, Jefferson say pulls out a copy of his version of the Constitution and he's going to run his finger along it and he's going to say to Washington where in the Constitution does it say this new national government can build a bank where does it say in Washington you know let's imagine he pulls out a magnifying glass or whatever you know he's looking over it and he says well crap Jefferson I guess you're right it doesn't say that the national government can build a bank and Jefferson taking this strict constructionist and by strict constructionist I mean if it's not in the Constitution the government can't do it it's got to say it word for word in the Constitution for the government to be able to do it um, he's going to argue that if it doesn't say the government can build a national bank then the government shouldn't be able to build a national bank so he takes this strict constructionist view by the way you know Basically, uh, you'll see this still these days. Usually, it's a party out of power is going to call for a strict constructionist view of the Constitution. You can only do exactly what the Constitution says. But then the second they get in power, they'll be saying the opposite. Oh, well, you know, we're taking this broad constructionist view, we're going to interpret. But Jefferson, look at him as, you know, he doesn't like what's going on and doesn't think that the Constitution allows for this, uh, this bank. So Washington, after hearing uh, Jefferson's strict constructionist view, is going to, uh, you know, put his ink, uh, you know, feather in the little uh, ink well or whatever, and he's going to be sitting there, you know, all right, well, I got to think about this because you got to remember, uh, the presidents have the 
ability to veto, but as they understood at the Constitutional Convention, they're only supposed to veto when they think something unconstitutional. So by Jefferson appealing to Washington to veto, he's he's urging him to take that uh, uh, use his veto to determine that it is not constitutional to do, to do this bank. So Washington, should I use my veto? Is this constitutional? Again, not exactly how it happens, but right after Jefferson leaves, I want you to imagine Alexander Hamilton, his eyes sort of pop out uh, of the shadows behind him, and he's going to creep up to Washington, and he's going to say, what did Jefferson want? And Washington's going to say, well, sh crap, where'd you come from, uh, Alexander Hamilton? Hamilton will say, you know, is he worried about the bank? And Washington's going to say, yeah, you know, he's got some good concerns. He says, it says nowhere in the Constitution that the government can build a bank. And I think he's right. I think that, you know, it, it, uh, it it's not in there. So I was considering uh, vetoing it. Well, Hamilton, let's just imagine him start giving Washington a nice massage. He's going to say to Washington, you know what? That's an interesting argu argument, but it doesn't need to say that the national government has the ability to uh, build a bank because it implies, the Constitution implies you can build a bank. And Hamilton's going to say, look at the Constitution. Does it say the government can have the ability to tax? And Washington will say, yes, yeah, right here. Remember, this is uh, one of the big things we couldn't do during the Arles Confederation. We can now do it. So absolutely, we have the ability to tax. Well, Hamilton's going to say, so we have the ability to tax what are we supposed to do with that tax money? You know, well, we can use a payback debt, stuff like that. Well, we're always not always going to have an immediate use for it, so we probably have to store that tax money somewhere on occasion. And and Washington's like, yeah, sure, of course. Well, Hamilton's going to say the ability to tax implies that you need a storage location, which implies that you need a bank. So it doesn't have to say it because the ability to tax implies that the national government has an ability to uh, build a national bank. Washington's going to say, you know what, Hamilton, I think you, uh, I think you, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And he's going to sign the national bank into law. Uh, by the way, this national bank, we won't get into it, is a lot more complicated than we portrayed it. Private individuals can put money in the bank as well. But just think of it for our purposes as just this, this place that will loan money out to people that are going to expand the economy of the United States and bring back uh, in money in the form of interest for the U.S. to pay off its debt and use uh, for other needs for the national government. So Hamilton, in creating it, has again further tied the U.S. government to the elites and is further uh, using the U.S.'s powers. And again, he takes this broad constructionist view of the Constitution to do it, and he convinces Washington uh, to follow his path. So Hamilton uh, has now gotten an additional thing in, an additional of his economic reforms put into law. All right, so now we're sitting here by 1792. The U.S. is starting to pay off its debts. The whiskey tax is working. This national bank quickly starts returning dividends as well. And as we're going to talk about, the, the U.S. is going to continue to become econo more economically powerful. Well, Hamilton isn't finished. At the end of 1791, He's going to begin writing up a new report. So he's wrote the report on public credit. He's recommended this whiskey tax, gotten that through, recommended the National Bank. By the time he sits down in 1791, he's pretty much gotten everything he's wanted through Congress and gotten it through uh, Washington's desk. So his next plan is going to be called the Report on Manufacture. So you might read it, Report on Manufacturing. What he's going to do in this report on manufacture, same thing as a report on public credit, has no bearing of law. It's just a recommendation to Congress. So Congress um, can do this. Uh, uh, it's just basically, Congress, I think you should do this next in your next session. I think these are the laws you should pass. So this report on manufacturing, what this is going to be is Hamilton will recommend that Congress pass an increased duty on incoming manufactured goods to the United States. So whenever goods arrive at the dock in the United States, you have this duty collector sitting there. All right, here's uh, a bunch of rice or whatever. Say come from the Caribbean. Um, you know, there's a 5% duty on incoming rice, you know. And at this point, 5% duty, I think that's a correct number, 5% incoming duty on shoes, okay? So whatever goods show up, 
similar price, similar duty on all the goods that are showing up at the docks. The dock collector, customs house collects this uh, from these incoming goods. Well, Hamilton is going to propose that the United States increase the duties whenever the good that comes in is not a raw product but a finished product. So if it's a, and I'm just making up the numbers here, but if it's a uh, piece of leather coming in, you only collect 5% duty on it. However, if it's a shoe, which is a finished product, the leather has been worked, it's been shaped into a shoe, uh, it's something that can be immediately used, you charge 25% duty on it. Same thing with wool. So if wool shows up, it's just a big old bushel of wool, 5% duty. But if it shows up and it's a shirt, you charge a 25% duty. Same thing, sugar, 5%. But if it's been manufactured, distilled into rum, 25%. So what's he trying to accomplish here? How does this fit Hamilton's goals and his, his vision for the future of the United States? Well, what he thinks is that if you charge these small duties, then or these large duties on the incoming manufactured goods, this is going to artificially raise the price of the goods as they come in. So let's imagine you're going out and you want to buy a pair of shoes. And you get to the store, and let's say, you know, the shoes you, uh, let's say Britain makes some really good shoes, U.S. makes some okay shoes too. You get to the store, Britain's been manufacturing a long time, they have a lot of the machines, they have the infrastructure, so without any duties you get to the store, and you know Britain even factoring the cost of transportation because their industry is so far ahead of the United States the shoes they're selling are going to be cheaper and probably better qualities than the shoes uh, the US manufacturer is selling. A guy trying to get off his feet just doesn't have the workers, doesn't have the machines need to produce shoes. So the British shoe let's say it's probably going to sell for 20 percent less. So let's say the US shoe costs 100 bucks, British shoe costs 80 bucks. If you're looking to buy shoes the British shoe, better quality, cheaper, of course you're going to buy that. But if you apply a higher duty on the British goods shoe when it comes in, by the time it hits the dock, you will have, uh, you know, again, making up numbers here, 50% duty collected on it. So give me uh, $40 because it's half what the shoe is going to sell for. Now the person gets to the store, they see the American shoe costs 100 the British shoe because it's been inflated with this additional duty that was been collected on it, cheapest it can sell, sell is for 120 because it's got to now factor in the cost of the duty. So if you're going to buy a shoe, you might buy the American shoe now. Well, if you buy the American shoe, this is more shoes sold for this American manufacturer. He's going to now, you know, get more money coming in. This is going to allow him to maybe buy the same machines the British uh, shoe manufacturer has, hire additional people, and pretty soon his shoe cost uh, to produce shoes going to drop down to 80 or whatever it was uh, that the British could, do, could produce it for. You basically promote American manufacturing by artificially right, raising the prices of incoming uh, manufactured goods from other places. So um, increased duty on manufactured goods. So that's one part of the report on manufacturing. Another part is going to be to provide subsidies for certain industries. So the US, and I don't know how the shoe manufacturing, but let's say the uh, uh, US is only a little bit behind in shoe manufacturing, just needs a sort of bump to help compete with Britain. US is way behind in certain industries and has no hope of catching up to Britain. Uh, for example, I think at the time the big one was uh, uh, kerosene production. You would take whale oil, you turn it into kerosene. Well, Britain has got the best whaling ships has got the best, um, you know, blubber, per, you know, whatever, a rendering plant, something like that. Light years ahead of the United States. U.S. isn't going to catch up anytime soon unless you give these industries money. So Hamilton proposed in the more report on manufacturing, just simply giving surplus money, you know, tax money, duty money, um, money off land sales, whiskey tax, whatever, giving these to certain people in certain industries. So today, we give out sub subsidies a lot. U.S. government does, you know, to uh, green energy. U.S. wants to outcompete whatever China or India or something in green energy. So the U.S. will take tax money and subsidize these industries. State governments do it as well. But at the time, this is going to be kind of crazy because you're going in from our Confederation government with nothing to now having a government that's so involved in the economy that you're promoting manufacturing and giving out money to industry to help with the economy. 
So from Articles of the Federation government, national government has no power in the economy or almost no power in the economy to having this government that can manipulate the economy. When this report on manufacturers is introduced to Congress, it's going to spark a huge debate. And as we're going to see, only a small part of it will get passed. Hamilton will get a slight increase on incoming manufactured goods, but he doesn't get nearly the incoming duty he wants, and he doesn't get any of the subsidies that he wants. This fails to get through. So 1790, he, he got uh, debt assumption. 1791, whiskey tax. 1791, National Bank. 1792, however, he's not able to get through what he wants. Why is this the case? What happens in 1792? Well, by this point, 1792, there are enough people that have opposed Hamilton that they've essentially started coming together to form this Republican Party. So what we're about to see, or what we have seen, you really can actually trace the first parties back to 1790, is you're going to see people click up who believe like Hamilton, and these people that click behind Hamilton are going to be the Federalists, and this other group are going to start clicking around these people that don't like Hamilton, and this group is going to be known as the Republicans, and these Republicans are going to be the reason that Hamilton's proposals dropped, uh, blocked in 1792. Alright, so who are the Republicans? What do they believe? Well, as we'll talk about in just a second, the two primary Republicans and these guys that don't like what Hamilton's doing are going to be this guy, Thomas Jefferson, and this guy, James Madison. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, when the Republican Party started uh, being introduced initially, they'll call it Mr. Madison's Party. Sometimes you'll see it Mr. Jefferson's Party before eventually being called the Democratic Republican Party or Republican Party for uh, short. Um, but what are these guys? Why do they oppose Hamilton? Well, a good reason is because it's just they believe different about the what the national government should do and they have just different philosophies in general than Hamilton. And again, the main guy that you can say is the leader of the Republican Party is going to be Jefferson. So while Hamilton's doing his thing, Jefferson's going to be at Washington's cabinet meetings and these guys are going to be arguing back and forth over Washington's head about the future of the United States. And again, it's a lot of it has to do with this uh, philosophy. So. Jefferson. Think about, when you think Republicans, think Jefferson. When you think Federalists, think Hamilton. Why does he oppose Hamilton? Well, a little bit has to do with a difference in background. Jefferson, uh, he was born in 1743, born in Virginia. He's actually born to a, uh, a very wealthy family in Virginia. His, his family uh, owned a lot of land. Uh, they'd acquired it over the colonial period. They used this land to grow tobacco, and they used it using African slaves. They'd acquired a number of African slaves to um, uh, uh, work the land, and Jefferson's going to inherit a number of these slaves uh, when he becomes an adult, and he's going to have this wealthy, profitable uh, plant, uh, plantation. Well, because his family's wealthy, this is going to give Jefferson opportunities that most kids in the South don't have, you know. Uh, vast majority of people in the South don't own slaves or are slaves themselves and uh, uh, generally lower class and don't have the uh, opportunity to educate themselves. Um, well, Jefferson's family being wealthy means that he's going to have a tutor growing up for his whole life. They're able to have enough money to hire a tutor. And so this tutor is going to educate Jefferson in all manner of uh, topics. He's going to learn a lot of philosophy, learns multiple different languages, uh, and he's going to develop this healthy attitude towards thinking. He's, he's going to read tons of books. As a matter of fact, later on the Library of Congress is going to burn down and Jefferson will uh, uh, end up donating his library of books. He's got so many uh, that they'll end up donating it to the Library of Congress to, to get it restarted. Uh, and this is at a time when books were really expensive, but his family's wealthy, he loves knowledge, he's going to start reading this thing. And as a matter of fact, Jefferson, after reading a lot, he's going to start publishing his own works, and he's going to start being this thinker and philosopher. He's going to have tons of different ideas on different subjects. He's going to be a scientist, he'll conduct some scientific experiments, like there's uh, uh, one invention he comes up with where he, he basically uh, uh, tries to sign the thing that where he can sign his name on multiple papers at the same time. It's basically an arm that will allow you to sign two things at the same time. 
Um, he's going to be uh, have a lot of f uh, philosophy. He's going to read a lot of different philosophy. He's actually going to apply this philosophy to religion. Jefferson would be a guy you would classify as a deist. He doesn't believe in the traditional uh, Christian uh, Bible. He believes in the teachings of it, but he doesn't believe in the supernatural stuff. We talked about you, you'd fit Franklin in that category. You'd also fit Jefferson in that category. Um, so you, you wouldn't really classify him as a Christian because he wrote his own version of the Bible that took out the supernatural elements of it and just taught the lesson. So uh, again, he would be uh, uh, somebody, a founding father, you, you wouldn't put in the Christianity camp. Um, he is going to come up with his own ideas on politics. As a matter of fact, as a young man, he uh, served in the House of Burgesses for Virginia, where he pushed for uh, uh, religious freedom. Uh, he's going to get the Virginia state government to basically say, we promise to have religious freedom here. Uh, there have been relative religious freedom before that, but uh, he's going to push that. Uh, he's going to become the guy that writes the Declaration of Independence. He's going to be one of the delegates to the uh, Second Continental Congress from Virginia. Uh, later on when they say, all right, we're splitting from King George for, for sure. I'll write something for us. Thomas Jefferson will author this uh, Declaration of Independence. Um, he's actually going to write so much. He, these ideas on science, I, I should point this out, he uh, prevailing theory in Europe at the time was Americans are naturally lesser than people from Europe. He writes a counter to this by basically showing that, you know, uh, people in the Americas are larger. One of the theories was they're smaller than people in Europe. He sends a moose over to Europe to prove that animals in the Americas are just as big as those in Europe. And he just wrote on a ton of stuff. And for this reason, he actually wrote so much on stuff that you can find him arguing one thing in one of his writings, and then you can find maybe a couple years later him writing something completely opposite. So uh, we, as a matter of fact, had a book. You know, he writes mostly about how he doesn't believe in Christianity and stuff like that. But then somebody, because he did write sometimes in favor of Christianity, somebody came out of the book and saying he was a Christian. And technically, you could make that argument because he did write uh, different things so much. For this reason, I'd caution anybody to ever quote Jefferson because if anybody quotes Jefferson, you can find some, but something from Jefferson that's going to say the complete opposite. So people that quote Jefferson are just those looking for somebody to support them. And if you want to basically come up with a quote that supports you, just look through Jefferson stuff. You'll find something there because he always uh, went back and forth on his ideas. So a thinker, and he's very well educated, incredibly well educated. Um, he is going to, uh, early in his life, become a lawyer. Again, he serves the House of Burgesses. Uh, he was a delegate at the First and Second Continental Congresses. During uh, the American Revolution, he was served as governor of Virginia. Um, after that, he serves as the Articles of Confederation um, ambassador to France. So uh, where is... Uh, uh, you know, Hamilton was there at the Constitution Convention. Jefferson was over in France. He wasn't present. Um, again, Jefferson, when he gets back because of his experience in France, Washington makes him his Secretary of State. And then, again, in 1789, he and Hamilton meet for the first time. And very quickly, they start getting their opposing ideas. And as, you know, uh, Hamilton will whisper something to Washington, Jefferson will come back and whisper something after. And again, one of the things that uh, uh, Jefferson kind of makes him unique is this guy being the author of Declaration of Independence and this guy that's got all these ideas and a lot of these ideas you would classify as Enlightenment ideas. In the uh, Declaration of In Independence he writes it, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Think about Jefferson and you can point this to hypocrisy, you can point this to a guy that just changes his mind a lot but the thing that we're going to see is he com constantly comes back to this idea of liberty and this idea that men are deserving of certain things, uh, no matter their circumstances, which makes it completely uh, ironic, I'm not sure if that's even the right word, that Jefferson was a slave owner. And he's going to be the slave owner that you know owns hundreds of slaves throughout his life. But his relationship with slavery is confusing. He would own slaves, but at the same time, he would argue that slavery was wrong. And during the American Revolution period, that wasn't unusual. A lot of Southerners would do that, and they would justify it by saying it's necessary for the economy. Jefferson would, would do that for certain, but you know he would at the same time be talking about not only how slavery was wrong, but blacks deserve equal citizenship, which is not something a lot of people were saying. So 
it's this guy that's a constant contradiction. And maybe one of the things that can be uh, uh, sort of show this contradiction is is the his relationship with. Um, one of his slaves, which is probably one of the things he's most famous for these days, is his relationship with a slave woman named uh, Sally Hemings. So Jefferson got married to uh, a woman, a white woman, uh, early in his life, had multiple children with her, but she's going to die uh, at a very young age. And after she dies, Jefferson's going to promise never to get married again. Well, he makes this promise. And he's going to stick to it. He doesn't get married again, but he is going to start this relationship with Sally Hemings. And I say relationship, and we're going to talk about uh, use of that word in just a second here. But in part, this relationship, it kind of makes sense because Sally Hemings is Jefferson's wife's sister. So she's his wife's sister. So uh, Jefferson's father-in-law, his wife's father, had a sexual relationship with one of his slaves, the product of it was Sally Hemings. And so Sally Hemings would have his wife's same mannerisms, would uh, beautiful like his wife. And so in some ways, like it, it almost makes sense to, that that would happen if you loved your wife and this woman's very similar to your wife. Of course, you would love her. But the problem with that, and this is going to be a problem that we have today with Jefferson, is that as he understood, and this isn't us coming back from moral judgment from the future, that was technically rape. Can you have a sexual relationship with a slave when the slave woman uh, can't say no? And if she says no, she'd be thrown to uh, the fields instead of working in the house, put a lot of extra work on. Could she um, have her children sold away from her? So can you technically have uh, a, a relationship that is not rape uh, with a woman who's enslaved? At the time, people said no, and it was looked down highly uh, to have sexual relationships with your slaves, but Jefferson did it anyway. Now, there have been people that made the argument that uh, they were truly in love and that Sally, Sally Hemings uh, married him as, uh, loved him as well. I, again, I, I don't know if th that's possible, but if you know it was true love, you, you would have thought that he would have given her her freedom, uh, but, but he didn't. And uh, uh, eventually, he's going to free the children that are going to be the product of their relationship, but not until... Uh, he died. So it's it, it's one of these things that a guy who's going to exemplify liberty wrote this Declaration of in Independence is also a guy that had this really questionable uh, uh, beliefs on slavery, and especially later in his life that we'll talk about a little bit later, he starts getting dug in on the uh, idea that maybe slavery's not even uh, morally wrong, that we need to just live with it, but he, he'll start sort of pushing towards the aim, almost positive good argument that we're going to see a lot of Southerners go to. So, walking contradiction in a lot of ways, Jefferson. But what he's going to be saying to Washington and the stance he's going to take through the 1790s is going to be uh, pretty consistent with his overall you know view on just about everything else with slavery. So, Again, Jefferson, same time Hamilton is whispering certain things, Jefferson is going to be whispering others. So what Jefferson is going to be arguing, same time that Hamilton is arguing, um, uh, what he's arguing, uh, we're going to see Jefferson basically pushing this belief that he has that humans are by nature good human beings. So to Hamilton, people are the mob, people are... Uh, incapable of rational thought they just fulfill their basic needs to Jefferson that's not true to him people are good and they're capable of rational thought taking care of one another as long as you provide them with basic education so whereas Hamilton would be calling for a monarchy because he didn't think people could make decisions in their day-to-day -day lives Jefferson's going to be a proponent not just of Republican government but uh, he's going to be a proponent of more democratic Republican government. So this is a big argument you got going on at the time is how much should the people pr uh, participate in the political process? Hamilton would say very little to none. Uh, Jefferson's going to argue some. Now maybe not direct democracy, but the you should have at least males uh, participating in, in the process in some way or another. So maybe if he had been president of the Constitutional Convention, he'd been one of those who are pushing for maybe direct election of senators and things like that. So people are good. They can make good decisions for themselves if provided with education. And uh, Republican government's good. And, and maybe we should have more democracy within our Republican government than we have at this time. Okay. 
So the reason that he has his beliefs on the Constitution, and as we're going to see, Jefferson's beliefs on constitutionality, strict construction versus broad construction, these will vary when his party gets in power, but out of power, he's going to hold the belief that you need to stick by exactly what this new Constitution says. If it doesn't say it, the government can't do it. And the reason he thinks this is because, you know, whereas Hamilton thinks you need a strong government to control the mob, Jefferson fears that. He thinks the government can get out of its hands, you can get, you know, people that don't mean well controlling the government, and then they can use this power to control the people, which could limit democracy and uh, limit, um, uh, just, just limit uh, free expression uh, of the people. So he fears a strong government, and to Jefferson, he would prefer power spread out more, so more localized, where people can participate more in the process. And so if you're going to ask Jefferson, he understands you need a strong national government, but he'd probably want more power within the states than the national government. So keep power local, whereas Hamilton, again, most of the power, centralized authority, strong national government to Jefferson, stronger state government. So more democratic, more local, more power within the states. He's going to constantly push for this, uh, these stronger states' rights, uh, at least uh, during the 1790s. So this is another thing that's going to Jefferson's going to embody, and he's also, as we're going to see, he's going to become the principles of this Republican Party. Another thing Jefferson's going to push for is a small to non-existent national army, whereas Hamilton wanted a large national army to basically keep the mob in control. Jefferson fears a large national army because he can, he fears it can oppress the liberties of the small. So he doesn't want this large national army. He'd prefer that most of the military be state militias. Maybe a small national army, but uh, uh, but a very small national army. The local militias can handle matters in case of invasion, things like that. So people are good. Democracy generally is good. Uh, Constitution got to stick to exactly what it says because we won't want the national government becoming too powerful. We want power in the states. Another one of Jefferson's beliefs is his belief in agriculture. To Jefferson, he would love if the United States stayed a a nation of individual, he would call them yeoman farmers, where people own their own land, they do their own work, they're dependent on themselves. Hamilton wants industry everywhere. Jefferson doesn't see industry as conducive to democratic republican government. Basically what he says is if you get too industrial, you're going to have people that are beholden to others. So you're going to basically have these wealthy factory owners and you're going to have, I'm just making up the number, 50 people under them. Those 50 people are now dependent on this guy at the top. So if this guy at the top controls the best interest of these people, you know, they depend on him for their pay, stuff like that. So when these people in a democratic republican form of government go to choose representatives, go to decide on certain issues, they're no longer going to be doing what's best for themselves, they might be doing what's best for this uh, individual that owns a factory because he controls their lives. They've essentially become a cog in a bigger machine. So what Hamilton, or I'm sorry, what Jefferson's going to propose is that if you own your own land, that basically puts you in charge of your own life. So you, if you work hard, you have a good harvest, you store a lot of grain for the winter, you're going to eat well for the winter, and you know, when you go to the voting booth, you're going to put in place representatives, you're going to vote in place policies that are going to befit you, you know, and help you out. You're not worried about, you know, the factory owner or something else. You're voting in your own best interest. So you're not a cog in the machine. You're basically the only person in the, uh, in the process. And you're, you're not going to have sort of the machinations that you would see uh, with industry. And again, this is somewhat ironic because Jefferson's pushing this. He himself didn't do the own, his own work on his own plantation. He had slaves do it, but he's going to be pushing for the idea of landowning people, doing their own work, doing their own farms, and then going in, uh, to vote in their best interest. So to Jefferson, he would like a United States filled with agriculture. Uh, again, doesn't distrust, uh, he distrusts banks in general, did not like the idea of the National Bank. Um, and it's not that he hates industry entirely, like he can see room for a little bit. He just doesn't think things like the report, uh, the recommendations in the report on manufacturing should be done by the national government. He doesn't think it's the government's responsibility to promote manufacturing. 
So another thing with uh, Jefferson's very different uh, from Hamilton. Hamilton wants to form closer ties with Britain for economic reasons. He wants to emulate Britain. He likes Britain. Jefferson's the opposite. He loves France. So France and Britain have constantly had this rivalry, always fighting with one another. Well, Jefferson... He loves France, and he almost always will want to side with France whenever it, uh, it and Britain are going to get into a conflict. Reasons for this, are, there's plenty of reasons. I mean, he knew French. He'd served in France as ambassador uh, for the United States during the Art of Confederation period. While he was over there, he just fell in love with French culture. He uh, uh, loved French food, music, art, that type of thing. Uh, when he comes back to the United States, he's actually going to bring a lot of that stuff back. Um, there are some people that say, I've heard this back and forth, I don't know if I've ever seen the primary source documents, but some people say that the uh, first time you had vanilla ice cream in the United States was when Jefferson returned from France. Other people credit him with bringing, bringing the first uh, French fries to the United States. He started making these dishes for his guests when they would come to his uh, visit him on his plantation in Virginia, and then they would leave man, i got to get this recipe, and eventually this stuff uh, starts going out to the United States. So he loves French culture, uh, and again, you know, as we're going to see uh, very shortly, uh, you know, France is going to be uh, supporting, uh, a lot of people in France are going to be pushing for what happened in the United States to happen in France. Um, another reason um, uh, he likes France is because French helped the United States during the American Revolution. The U.S. obviously fought Britain, so we should break our ties completely even though France doesn't have the manufacturing can't buy the raw goods from us that Britain can maybe we can help them get their manufacturing base start started at the same time um, you know uh, uh, you know we we can grow and they can grow together so we can send them raw goods uh, from the United States let's foster better ties with France so Jefferson very different than Hamilton. Hamilton, England, Jefferson, France, Hamilton industry, uh, Jefferson, the future of the U.S. should be in agriculture, Hamilton, people bad, Jefferson, people good, Hamilton, broad constructionist, you know, it doesn't have to write it exactly, Jefferson, if it's, if it's, uh, it's got to be in the Constitution for the government to do it, Hamilton, strong central government, Jefferson, small central government, uh, most of the power in states. All right, so Jefferson, he sees he and, and his uh, buddy James Madison, this other guy from Virginia, they're going to see what's happening from 1790 with Hamilton's economic reforms, and they're going to say, we don't like this. We don't like what's happening here. So what Jefferson and Madison are going to be doing from 1790 to 1792 is they're going to start getting people to click up. They're going to start going around any, to anybody they can and saying, hey, do you believe what Jefferson believes or do you believe what Hamilton believes? Well, you know, I believe what Jefferson believes. All right, well, we're forming this Democratic Republican Party. Uh, come over here and vote against Hamilton's things. Occasionally, you might have to vote against something that's in your best interest, but we need to oppose Hamilton. And you can almost, almost think of the Republicans as being part what Jefferson believes, but part screw Hamilton. You know, F Hamilton, uh, we're, we're going to try and stop him however we can. So these guys are going to start to seek out people to oppose Hamilton. So basically, the way the parties are going to come to break down is you're going to have Madison and Jefferson being the uh, Republican Party. And Hamilton, in order to uh, oppose these guys, he needs to get votes to support his plan. He's going to form the Federalists, and we're going to see that People that believe like Hamilton will start flocking behind him, sometimes voting against their own best interests for the larger interests of this Federalist Party, and he's going to get some supporters. Now, we're only going to talk about a couple of the prominent Federalists, um, but some of the guys who are going to fall in line with Hamilton are going to be George Washington and John Adams. Now, here's the thing about Washington. He will completely decry political parties. That political parties are bad. They're, you know, uh, and he's going to start, you know, talking smack, uh, you know, about those forming these political parties. And he just constantly says throughout his first and second administration, uh, he, we're going to talk about him getting second administration in a second here. He's going to say political parties are bad. At the same time, he's saying this though. He pretty much does everything that Hamilton wants. So he wouldn't call himself a Federalist. But, you know, history looks at him as saying, yeah, he's not a Federalist, but he and Hamilton are, are sort of uh, hand in hand. 
Another guy that you would call a Federalist and who would identify themselves as a Federalist would be the Vice President John Adams. So John Adams uh, basically has the same political beliefs as Alexander Hamilton uh, and, and is going to support uh, his uh, uh, views in Congress. Now, it's kind of interesting because John Adams doesn't personally like Alexander Hamilton. As a matter of fact, he dislikes Ham Hamilton heavily and there's going to be a lot of personal animosity. But at the same time, you would call these guys uh, Federalists. So we start seeing this clicking up between the various parties. Well, how did the Republicans come together? Well, this is going to, again, start really 1790, right, with the report on uh, debt assumption. What these guys are going to do is they're going to start going out and trying to find people that agree with them in any way, uh, people that don't like Hamilton. Well, where are we going to find these guys? Well, what they'll do is... Where do a lot of people distrust Hamilton? Well, one of the places they're going to find votes is they're going to start looking uh, in these western areas. We have um, uh, a lot of westerners don't like uh, uh, Jefferson. I'm sorry, Hamilton because of the whiskey tax. Uh, so you'll find a lot of people don't like him out there. A lot of southerners distrust the banks. So we'll recruit them. Uh, they'll also recruit guys like Aaron Burr. Basically, Aaron Burr, you would call him middle class. Um, Aaron Burr, he's not a guy that you know, maybe you would consider him one of Hamilton's elites, but he's not a guy that's going to benefit extremely from things like the National Bank. He's not a guy that is going to be uh, being paid a lot back by the national government. He'd be considered a middle-class merchant. And the thing with Burr, and a lot of other of these guys are going to uh, view the uh, join the Republican Party. They're not necessarily going to join because they... Um, uh, agree with Jefferson, but a lot of them are going to look at it like as a political opportunity. So Burr will join the Republicans because he sees his party as a way to get power, and the Republicans are going to welcome in because they see it as a way to appeal to middle class people, uh, maybe people that aren't going to benefit from Hamilton's reforms. Uh, and also, they particularly seek out Burr because they look in particular for people from the north and uh, these northern and middle states. Because a lot of the people that are going to join them are Westerners and Southerners, but we need some guys from up here. We need some support up there. Aaron Burr from New York, which is the biggest state in the northern half of the uh, the states. Uh, we want we want some votes from there, so we'll pick up guys like Aaron Burr. So they start getting people to again give up their best interest to oppose Hamilton. Uh, get guys like um, uh, Burr and uh, uh, Burr to join them. Well, where else can we get votes? Well, 1792, uh, Madison and uh, Jefferson, in order to get votes, in order to increase the power of the Republican Party, their opposition to Hamilton, they're going to push for the inclusion of two new states. So in 1792, we have this Vermont. We're, we're not going to get to talk about Vermont very much. Just know there's this area that wasn't well controlled by New Hampshire, wasn't controlled by New York. Um, both New Hampshire and New York claim this region, but it's very remote. A lot of people had moved to Vermont, and during the Arts of Confederation period, some people even claimed that this was its own independent country, uh, was making its own rules. Well, a lot of people here um, have been calling for statehood, uh, separation from New Hampshire and New York, and to be entered as a 14th state. And we talked about this for, before. Same thing's happening in Kentucky. Well, the thing with Vermont, again, is that New Hampshire and New York have their claims to Vermont. Virginia has claims to Kentucky. So what Jefferson and Madison will do is basically they're going to push in Congress for statehood for these two states. Uh, so what they're going to do, they're both uh, Madison and Jefferson are from Virginia. They're going to go to Virginia and they're going to encourage it to give up land claims to Kentucky, um, uh, this area over here. So Virginia, we give up these land claims. Let us form a 14th state of Kentucky and they're going to find enough support to get uh, New Hampshire and New York to give up its land claims to Vermont. So we're going to see 1792, right around 1792, both uh, New York, I'm sorry, Vermont and Kentucky will enter into the Union as separate states. The reason this is important to Jefferson and Madison is because this is going to mean two additional, uh, two additional uh, states that are uh, are going to be supporting them in the Senate. All right, so Jefferson and Madison uh, start getting. Um, uh, support this way. So adding states, finding Westerners and Southerners are going to support you, finding middle class people like Aaron Burr. 
How else are they going to get support? Well, one thing they're going to start doing is encouraging states to expand democracy. So Jefferson setting up this Republican Party as to being the everyman opposition to Hamilton and his Federalists. So if you had a popular vote and the majority of people in the United States wouldn't be considered part of Hamilton's elites, they're probably not going to vote for Hamilton because, uh, you know, if Hamilton's calling them the mob, stuff like that, they're not going to vote for him. Well, the problem for Jefferson and Madison, the Republican Party, is that when, per the Constitution, there's not that many people that uh, they can vote in elections. Again, the, it says the House of Representatives is chosen by popular vote, but all states, almost all states, had set up to where the only people that can vote in House of Representative rep elections are those worth a certain amount of property. Well, Jefferson's going to go to places like Virginia, Maryland, places where he has sway, and he's going to say to these states, why don't you lift these property restrictions, uh, voting for the House of Representatives? We need support in the House of Representatives, and if the people vote, it sort of gives us the moral high ground because we're promoting uh, additional democracy, and we know that whoever they're going to vote for, they're probably not going to vote for Hamilton. They're going to vote for us. So Jefferson and Madison will push for this uh, uh, additional democratic vote. Um, they're also going to uh, push even Virginia into allowing its people to choose their electors to choose who votes in presidential elections. That's not something that uh, uh, they initially uh, uh, thought of when they thought the Electoral College, but now they're going to be calling this uh, for this. Another thing that Jefferson and uh, Hamilton, are, or I'm sorry, Madison are going to be calling for is newspapers that support them to start talking poorly about Hamilton. Now, you wouldn't think that this is something that could occur, you know, uh, this day and age. All our news organizations are certainly uh, have no bias, and they only report things as they factually occur. But, you know, the, there are actually news organizations that serve as mouthpieces for one party or another. This is nothing new. From the very beginning, Hamilton's going to start getting newspaper reporters friendly to him to start talking smack about the Republicans. Jefferson and Madison are going to get newspapers that are loyal to the Republicans to start talking smack about Hamilton. So you almost want to think about the way Jefferson and Madison are doing things as like forming a big party like Nick Fury would form the Avengers. Basically getting um, you know, all the different guys together, Hulk, come here, Westerners, come here, you know, uh, Ant-Man, come here, you know, um, uh, Southerners together. Um, hey, you know, Captain America, you would be, got middle class people like Aaron Burr. Hey, we're getting newspaper support. Black Widow, come over here. Hawkeye, nobody wants you. You're boring. No, you're not coming in. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, Kentucky, Vermont, you know, uh, you would be, let's go with uh, Thor. You guys come in. And they're starting to get these parties together. And by 1792, we start to see these uh, major political divisions within the United States. And we're going to have to see if these things can, the United States can handle it with these two political parties. Um, yeah, and it basically we're going to see George Washington uh, is going to be elected a second term. The electors, except for Virginia, are going to be chosen the traditional way. But when they go, they're also going to unanimously approve Washington. He now has these political parties to deal with. Can the country and this new constitution handle it?